Today we're going to continue on with our discussions on nomenclature and focus on three different types of molecules. First, we're going to take a look at diatomic molecules and how to name them. So first, let's make sure we understand what we mean when we say diatomic molecule. It's a molecule composed of two atoms of the same element. If you remember our discussion on prefixes, diatomic means two. So di is in there to say two atoms in a molecule. What are the formulas? Or what are the elements? So hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. Or if you remember the acronym Hofbrinkle, you may have learned that from your grade 10 teacher, that tells you which elements form diatomic molecules. And forming diatomic molecules makes them very stable, and that's why they like to have a partner paired up with an atom of the same element. Almost all of them are gases except for two. Bromine's a liquid and iodine is a solid at room temperature. So if you need to write the formula for any of these elements, if it's in a chemical equation or at any point, the thing you have to remember is you always put a two beside them because two of them always come together. That's their natural state. When you're naming them, all you have to do is take the name of the element and write it down. You don't have to change anything with it. Typically what you see is if it is a gas at room temperature, so not bromine and not iodine, the word gas is often included. Sometimes not, but most commonly it will be there. So if we looked at two examples, just to compare, if you were asked to write the formula for hydrogen gas, you would write H2 and put the G for gas. If you were asked to name it, it would be called hydrogen gas. Same thing if you were asked to write the formula for bromine. Bromine is Br2 and you put its state, which is liquid. But on its own with its name, you would just say bromine. You don't have to use the word liquid here at all. So these ones are fairly straightforward. The only trick is remembering which ones fall into this category. That's usually the hardest part. Next, we're going to have a look at how to name noble gases. These ones are very easy, and there's probably nothing surprising here. If you're writing the formula for a noble gas, all you need to do is write down the symbol. So any one of these are your hydrogen gases. All you need to do is write down that symbol. If you name the compound, you just stick with the name, element name. So here's an example with helium. We would write the symbol HE for the chemical formula. And for its name, you can either write helium or you can write helium gas. And the reason why the word isn't always necessary is because they're noble gases, they're implied that they're gases. So that's one thing that you can, that you can omit if necessary. Now the bulk of our lesson for today is going to be focused on polyatomic ions. So polyatomic ions, you would have learned how to name them in grade 10, but we're going to add more to it this year. So all the naming rules that you learned are basically the same, but what's different is going to be how many polyatomic ions we work with. There's quite a few more that you probably weren't aware of, so we'll learn about those today and how to name and write their formulas. So first, let's do a quick review. What's a polyatomic ion? A polyatomic ion is also sometimes called a radical or a radical ion. What's different about these types of ions, it's not just one atom. These ones are composed of more than one atom, but they act as a single unit. So that means they don't separate, they don't break down, they stick together. Imagine being stuck together by glue and those number of atoms stick together and work together. When it comes to naming, they're very similar to a lot of the rules we've seen so far. 
So most of the most of the elements that we see are going to be metals paired up with polyatomic ions. But hydrogen can also be in there. Either way, you either take the metal name unchanged or you use the word hydrogen for hydrogen. In the middle here, you may or may not need to use a Roman numeral or use the classical system. So if it has multi-charge, if that metal has a multi-charge, more than one, you're going to use stock system or you're going to use the classical. Either one could work. When it comes to formula writing, this is the same as pretty much every other formula aside from covalent compounds. We're going to do the crisscross with the charges. So we're going to write our symbols. We're going to write the charges on top and then we're going to crisscross and simplify. So here's a list of your new polyatomic ions. There's quite a few of them. So there's two panels here. Both of them actually have the same number and same kinds of ions on both sides. They are just organized differently. The one that's on the left here is going to be alphabetical by name. And the one on the right is alphabetical by formula. So what does that mean? Here's names and here are formulas. So here, if you're going down, it goes in alphabetical order, A's, B's, C's, and so on. Here we've got formulas and names. Here the symbol is showing an order alphabetically going all the way down. This is just a reference sheet. You don't need to memorize this. So don't memorize this one. But what I'd recommend doing, and even part of your homework, take a look at the list, read through them, and maybe even either type them out or write them out. Writing formulas is a bit of a pain to type, so you may want to write them out. But I would go through and write the name and the formula for each of them, just so you can get familiar. Because there's so many new ones in here, and the list goes on and on and on, that you'll want to make sure that you've at least given some chance to study what they are. So when you run into them later on, you'll know what to expect. So now let's try some examples together. So let's take a look at this first one here. So the rule is we're going to put the metal name first. So this is a metal, it's sodium. Check to see how many charges sodium has. And you should notice it only has one value, positive one. So we don't need the Roman numeral. We don't need stock system. I'm sorry, we don't need classical system. So we just leave it as is. Then we want to look for the polyatomic ion. Now, if you're looking at it and finding hard, Either circle or highlight that first element, which we just wrote down. Then we're just looking for the other elements that are after the metal. So something with phosphorus and something with oxygen. So I would go back to my list. And since I'm working with formula here, I might want to use the one that's on the side. And I'm going to scroll it down and look for P. And I get all the way down here. And here's PO4. That looks right. And it means I've got the phosphate ion. And so the formula hasn't changed, it's phosphate, so I just need to write its name. Phosphate. So this is called sodium phosphate. So here are two for you to try. Why don't you pause the video and see if you can name these two. All right, I hope you've given this a shot and tried to name these ones. Let's walk through it together. First, I'm going to name my metal. My metal here is calcium. 
when I look at calcium on the periodic table, it only has one charge, positive two. So I don't need the Stalker classical systems here. Then I need to go and look. What polyatomic ion has sulfur and oxygen with numbers similar to these, two and three? So same thing, I'm gonna go down my list. I'm gonna use this one here, going down, down, down. Oh, look, here's thiosulfate, S2O3. So it's called thiosulfate. That's the name that I'm going to write down for my formula. All right, now let's check the last one. So when I have a look, Fe is iron. When I look at iron, I notice, okay, here I've got two charges. Iron can be two or it can be three. So I need to look over here. Here I see a two. It's coming from the iron here. But I want to double check what's the charge of my polyatomic ion just to make sure that there's no simplifying happening. So we'll come back to identifying the charge. Let's look at C and N for my polyatomic ion first. So again, I go down my list. Here's C and N, the negative one charge. It's cyanide. So cyanide, since it has a charge of negative one, I know the one that's down here with the iron came from it. So I can put cyanide here. So if cyanide is one, then this two isn't simplified. So that means out of the two charges for iron, I have to indicate that number two is being used. So I can either use my stock system and put Roman numeral in brackets, or if you're using the classical system, I would write ferrous cyanide. Now let's try and do the reverse. What if you're given a name and you have to write a chemical formula? So let's try the first one together and then I'll let you try the others. So we'll do our rough work down here and put our answer over here. I look for the symbol for my metal. Potassium is K and it has a charge of one. I need to go and find what the formula for chromate is. So I'm going to go back to my list and I'm going to use this side this time because it's by name and I'm going down and I want to find chromate. Here it is, CrO4 with a negative two charge. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to write that down here. And then I need to do the crisscross. So the two comes down with potassium, the one comes down with the chromate. So it should look like this. If you remember with polyatomic ions, you need brackets around them with a the charge, except for the number one. So another way of thinking of this one, when we do the crisscross, the one comes down, but it's for the entire polyatomic ion. So inside the bracket, it tells you the number there. But for ones, we leave it out, so then we don't need the bracket. So this is a common way to see it, but that's pretty much what we're saying here. So now I'm going to give you two to try, and let's see how you do with those. So try these one out, pause your video, and then we'll have a look at them together. All right, hopefully you've tried these ones out. So when I see the term stanic, I know it's a classical naming for tin. The symbol for tin is SN. And when I go on the periodic table, I notice there are two chargers for tin, two and four. But since I have the IC ending, that means I need the larger one. So the charge that I'm gonna use for tin here is four. Then I need to go look up thiocyanate. When I go and look up thiocyanate on my list, it's SCN with a negative one charge. And then I'm able to do my crisscross. So when I do that, my final answer should be one tin. And then in brackets, I have to make sure that I put that whole ion and then I put a four on the outside.
Last one, aluminum acetate. So I look up aluminum. Aluminum is Al, and it only has a charge of three. So I don't need stock or classical system here at all. It's just three. Then I look up acetate. Acetate is C2H3O2. It has a charge of negative one. So if I do my crisscross, I have to do my crisscross like that. Al is one. Put the brackets in. Because it goes for the entire ion and then a three outside. If for some reason you forgot to put the brackets, this is what you might have done. Al C2H3O2 and then just put the three here. When you take a step back and look, all of a sudden now you've written 23 oxygens. That's not good. You don't want to do that. You need to make sure you put a bracket around it. Otherwise you you get these weird numbers that don't make any sense. Now one other thing to point out about acetate is there's two ways you can see the acetate ion. This is the way that you see it on your list, but it can also be expanded. And it looks like that. They're both the same. This is condensed, this is expanded, has the same number of atoms but sometimes you might see the acetate ion looking like that. So make sure you get lots of new practice with your new list of ions. There's lots of worksheets, and the more you practice, the better you'll get.